Welcome to class 15 in our continuing study of the book of Colossians. In class 14, we looked at verses 8 and 9 and 10. So let's review those quickly before we start in verse 11. We are in chapter 2 of the book of Colossians. And uh, you may want to get your Bible and listen. Or if you're driving or doing something else, don't look at anything. Just keep on driving. But I hope you enjoy listening to these words from the scripture. Verse 8, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the basic principles of this world rather than on Christ. Now this is great advice for all of us, certainly for myself. And he establishes, he, Paul, establishes in verse 6 and 7, the importance of receiving Christ, continuing to live in Christ, rooted and built up in Christ, strengthened in the faith and what we believe as we are taught. Great to have teachers, mentors, and consequently we are overflowing with thankfulness. On the other hand, there's folks that are out there with wrong information, false information, heresies if you want to use that term, um, misuse of information, information that's not the gospel, information that's not true. See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow and deceptive philosophy. So what happens is that information, which is not only false, which can actually hurt you, is deceptive and vapid, hollow, weak, no effect. It depends, this philosophy, on human tradition and the basic principles of this world. That is not what we want to depend on, rather than on Christ. We want to depend on Christ. Your knowledge of the Word of God, your study of the Word of God, your, uh, your correct understanding of the Word of God is paramount, is significant, is highly important. So a good Bible study or a good commentary is very, very important to the believer so that he or she receives the correct instruction and consequently acts upon that instruction in a positive and productive way. Verse 9. So my prayer again for all of us is we'll do verse 6 and 7 and 8 well. For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. So Paul is placing his tremendous emphasis in ministering to the Colossian people, much like he ministered in Galatia, Galatians, Rome, Romans, Philippi, Philippians, Ephesians, Ephesus, he is placing the onus and the truth is centered in Christ. Christ is the key figure in the Bible. He is the key figure in the Bible. In order for God to save us, he has to work through Jesus Christ. He's working through his son who died for us so that everyone that calls the name of the Lord Romans chapter 10, will be saved. We confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. We confess our sins. We follow Christ. Then, as it says again in Colossians 2, 6, and 7, we are rooted in Christ. We are built up in Christ. We are living in Christ. We are strengthened in Christ. That way we can avoid philosophies, ideologies, methodologies, worldviews that are false. Christ is so great that the fullness of the deity lives in him. That the fullness of who the God is, is present in Christ in bodily form. That's just fantastic. And you have been given fullness of Christ. Now you have fullness of Christ, those of you that know Christ. You have that fullness. It's all, it's present there inside of you. It's a great scripture, verse 10. Who is head over every power and authority? Now, there's no telling how many powers and authorities are in our world. But every power and every authority, you can have authority without power and power without authority, right? Okay, you all know that. Every power and authority. Now, the best case scenario is you have both power and authority. 
Every one of them. Make a list. Jesus is greater than all of them. He's greater than all of these. Jesus is at the top. In Matthew 28, which is the last chapter of Matthew, all authority in heaven and earth has been given to Jesus Christ. Matthew 28, 18. It's all been given to, by Christ. All given. It's Christ. All power, all authority. He is the head of all. Verse 11. In him you were also circumcised. Now, everybody know what circumcision is? In the putting off of the sinful nature. So in circumcision, there's a cutting away of the flesh. There's a cutting away of the flesh. In our sinful nature, there's a putting off of it in Christ. In him, you were circumcised. So he takes away the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men. So it's not a fleshly circumcision. Males were circumcised. Okay? As part of the covenant of God in the Old Testament. Not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but with a circumcision done by Christ. It's an astonishing statement that Christ is putting off your sinful nature by circumcising you and me, male and female, in Christ, putting off the sinful nature, not with a circumcision done by the hands of men, but the circumcision by Christ. So the sinful nature, if I can use the term, is peeled away. Okay? Now, the sinful nature is our flesh. Sarx is the Greek word, is our flesh. That is not my body, per se, but my flesh, which is in enmity with God, Romans 8, Galatians 5, which is in enmity with God and not of the Lord. That is our basic nature, yours and mine. Mine and yours. We're all in Adam. 1 Corinthians 15, 22, and separated from Christ. We are in Adam, and our sinful nature, if we live by it, we will perish. Jesus died for us, and those that confess their sins and follow Christ have a circumcision, not done physically, but the circumcision by Christ where the sinful nature is taken care of. Now, that's fantastic news. That's, again, gospel news, that Christ has taken care of our sinful nature. So, as the individual moves from being in Adam, which I just made reference to, to being in Christ, this, again, is a supernatural, supernatural process. I can't undo my sinful nature. I cannot circumcise my sinful nature. I can circumcise my flesh. That's not going to save me or get rid of my sinful nature. Only Christ can do that. I cannot do that. You cannot do that. You could circumcise your flesh, though. Males. But that physical reality is not going to save you. But when Christ circumcises your sinful nature, that is very, very, very powerful. Very powerful. So here, we, this is our sinful nature. This is the nature that we exhibit in Adam. In this situation, we are in Christ. I've already talked about Christ in the last couple of classes. Paul talks about being in Christ. In our sinful nature is being circumcised by Christ. Circumcised by Christ. Remember, you and I, 
we can't do anything. That sinful nature is not going to go away unless Christ does something. In him you were circumcised, verse 11, in the putting off of the sinful nature, not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ, having been buried with him in baptism under the water and raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. Again, this is a tremendous work of God, of which, as it says at the end, of verse 7 of Colossians 2, we should be overflowing with thankfulness. I can always be more grateful. You can always be more grateful to Christ. In him you were circumcised, putting off the sinful nature. The circumcision is done by Christ. We're buried with him in baptism. This is the importance of baptism. Now what happens is, in that water situation where we go under the water, if you will, we are buried with him in, Christ, in baptism, and we are raised up with him through your faith in the power of God. How much power does God have? He raised Jesus from the dead. He raised a man from the dead. Jesus is not, didn't, has not died again. He's died. He was in that tomb. But God raised him from the dead all by, without even showing up. I mean, he raised him from the dead. All right. That power is present in us. And God has raised us with him through our faith in the power of God. Do you see how important your faith is in verse 12? Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith in the power of God. Your faith is extremely important. As I said in the last class, class 14, we have faith, we have the faith. Your personal faith in Christ, your faith in God, your relationship with the Holy Trinity, extremely important. The faith, the teachings, the doctrine, the faith that has to do with Christianity is extremely important. You want to incorporate that faith into your life. Again, back to 6 and 7 of chapter 2, rooted and built up in him, continue to live in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught, 7b, overflowing with thankfulness, being buried with him in baptism, verse 12, raised with him through faith in the power of God who raised him from the dead. So you go from being in Adam, having your sinful nature perfectly intact, disobeying the Lord, lost in darkness, without Christ, without hope. Two, knowing Christ, following Christ, being forgiven of your sins, circumcised by Christ. He circumcises the sinful nature which is great news. He raises us up from the dead. We're buried with Christ in baptism. Buried with him in baptism. Remember, Jesus buried, then rises from the dead, is raised from the dead by God the Father. Jesus did raise himself from the dead. God raised him from the dead. Raised up from the dead. Buried, sins buried. Comes up, sin taken care of, sinful nature taken care of, forgiven. Again, great news, raised up. Raised up in the power of God. How great is the power of God? Fantastically great. When you were dead in sins, verse 13. Now, does everybody understand what dead means? Dead means that you and I have no ability to go from there. We are dead. What has killed us? Our sins. Now, are you physically dead? No, nope, you're not physically dead yet. You're still alive. We're not here very long. But your sin kills you. This sinful nature, dead in our sins. 
Certainly not singular. Sins. Lots of sins. Dead in those sins. Now, he could have left you there. He could have left you there, and you'd be dead in Adam, in your sinful nature, no circumcision by Christ, no being raised from the dead, lost without Christ, without hope. Dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature. Your sinful nature is not circumcised. Brilliant writing. The sinful nature has to be circumcised. It has to fall away. It has to be taken care of. If it's not, and you are uncircumcised, as it were, then it's still with you. It's part of your being. It's a part of your who you are. And it travels with you everywhere you go. Only Christ can take care of that. Only Christ can take care of your sins because you're dead. You're dead in your sins, and your sinful nature is uncircumcised. Worst case scenario for anyone. Worst case scenario. You have no hope. Ephesians chapter 2, 1, 2, and 3. No hope and without God in the world. Dead in your sins, dead in your flesh, walking according to the pattern of this world, submitting to the Holy, to the, not to the Holy Spirit, should be submitting to the Holy Spirit, but not. Um, submitting to the power of evil, being controlled by the power of evil. When you were dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. Did you make yourself alive with Christ? That's not what he says here. You can't save yourself. I can't save myself. God saves you. What did he do? He made you alive. What were you? Dead. You're an Adam. Your sinful nature is uncircumcised. You have no hope of being able to save yourself because you're dead. The sin in your life has killed you. Who is going to rescue me? Who's going to save me? Only Christ. When you're dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. Your whole life is a thanksgiving to God for saving you in Christ. Your whole life is gratefulness, thankfulness, praise, worship, adoration to Christ for having saved a person that's dead, that's uncircumcised in their sinful nature, who cannot make them alive, who cannot escape that sinful nature, who cannot do what God wants them to do because they're dead in their sins and their sins have killed them. Spiritually, God made you alive with Christ. He didn't make you alive by any other means but through Christ. Christ is the key, as I said, to all of this. The understanding from Genesis to Revelation that make up the Old and New Testaments. Christ made, God made you alive with Christ. Now, what did he do? Well, we're going to find out what he did in the next class, class 16. What did he do? Well, if you want to read ahead, read the rest of of chapter 2, verse 13, and 14, and 15. It's astonishing what the man did for us in verses 13, 14, and 15. Those are indicative facts. Those are, those are the things that he did. Did he have to do them? He did not. Was he compelled to do it and somebody forced him to do them? They did not. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the Holy Trinity of God, by the mercy and grace, through their mercy and grace, which is in, of superabundance, this is what they chose to do for you and me. Lord God, we could never thank you enough for giving us such a great salvation. All of us in this wonderful audience, thank you for what Christ has done for us. I pray that each and every person may confess their sins and follow Christ all the days of their life. That we would be overflowing with thankfulness and praise and adoration and worship and what Christ has done for us not being deceived in any way and taken captive from 
hollow and deceptive philosophies which depend on human traditions and the principles of this world rather than on Christ. Let us put Christ first. Lord God, forgive us when we do not do that. May the Holy Spirit empower us on a daily basis to live for Christ, to live in Christ and to obey Christ. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Well, next week, class 16, we'll look at the fantastic answer at the end of the middle of Colossians chapter 2, which gives us great hope and great joy. God bless you, and have a wonderful week.